Welcome to the Common Toad podcast. Uh, tonight we have uh, Hussein Ibish with us. Uh, he's a senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, D.C. He's a regular columnist for Bloomberg. He's a regular columnist for a publication called The National, which I think is out of the UAE. Is that right? Yes, it's a daily newspaper in the UAE. Very okay. good. Uh, uh, very good. So, yeah, and he's also, um, he has a very big Twitter presence, I think is fair to say, too. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know in, in terms of followers. I have no idea how many followers you have, but you're, you're always on top of things, I've noticed. Almost 30,000, which is, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it could be more, could be less. Whatever. It's not Trump numbers. but No, no, no. It's, not, you know, it, it is what it is. But yeah, I, I, I still enjoy Twitter. You know, Twitter used to be much more fun before the trolls and the bots and the Trumps. When would that have been? Well, like, let's say six, seven years ago. It was uh, just journalists and stuff? It, well, it wasn't just journalists, but it was a lot less hostile. You had a much better sense that you knew who you were talking to, and yeah. there was a lot less organized um, malfeasance, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. And, but it's still, I still find it m more useful than not, and that's not at all true of, of Facebook which I think is just a, uh, a platform for evil disinformation. And I cut off all ties to Facebook years ago. Yeah, I mean, I mean you can actually curate Twitter to... Exactly. You know, yeah, it makes sense. And, and Twitter also is trying on disinformation a little bit. And Facebook yeah. really isn't. It's, it's not, Twitter's business model is not predicated on serving as a platform for disinformation. And I think Facebook's right. model has become that, in fact. Yeah. Um, I don't know how exactly I, I started following you. Somebody must have retweeted something. And uh, so you would sort of, I had followed you for, I don't know, maybe a year or something like that. Um, but it's about a month or so ago, I guess you had uh, tweeted something about Christopher Hitchens. And I had yeah. vaguely known that you knew Christopher Hitchens, the legendary, um, controversial, whatever people want to call him, journalist, great writer, great speaker. Um, very singular person, as far as I can tell. I kind of grew up on his stuff in high school, reading his columns and, yep. and beyond. And um, I thought, ah, it's, you know, I mean, I would like to talk to somebody who really knew him and yep. wasn't just a, a fanboy or somebody who hated him or somebody who, you know, went to <laughs> and rubbed elbows with him one time or something. No, like no. That. Uh, we, we were very close. Yeah. So I would like to start, I guess, by just sort of having you give a, a bridged version of kind of who you are, you came from, I know you were born in Lebanon, correct? Yeah. yeah. What brought you to Washington? What's the, what's the road from, from well, Lebanon to DC? Yeah. So I was living in Lebanon off and on, uh, in Europe and Cyprus and Lebanon. And, and, uh, there was a, the war, uh, in Lebanon started in 75 when I was 12. Right. And, you know, my family kept trying to live there. And uh, in 1980, I was 17, and I had basically passed one high school course. And I just was, life was not working out for me. And, uh, you know, so I, I uh, made my way to the United States and uh, got into a university. Uh, and um, I, I ended up, uh, you know, doing a PhD in comparative literature at the University of Massachusetts and then taking a job in Washington. And uh, that's where I met Christopher. Uh, it was very shortly after I arrived in Washington that I met him. Uh, but yeah, just, just to round things out, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a Lebanese citizen and also technically a Syrian citizen and a U.S. citizen. I'm not, I'm not an immigrant. I, I'm a, I have a State Department birth certificate for an American born overseas, kind of like uh, Ted Cruz, you know, in Canada. <laughs> in a funny way, McCain, although he was born on a military base. But, right. but I'm one of those people who was an American at birth, although I wasn't born um, here, in the same way that there are, like, the children of diplomats who are born in the United States are not Americans. Uh, if they ever want to become Americans, they have to, you know, it's as if they were born overseas. How did you get Syrian citizenship? Oh, uh, because my father registered me in Lebanon as born in Lebanon, which was true. And he registered me as born in Syria, which was not. Uh, if in, the, in the Levantine countries, if you're in the book of the local Mukhtar, the local kind of um, 
chief administrative officer of a, of a, of a administered region in a city, then you are lawfully uh, that, you know, and, and um, you know, so uh, I've never had a Syrian passport. I've had Lebanese passports and I've always had an American passport. But anyway, so, yeah, so I, I consider myself an Arab American and, um, you know, I, as I say, I'm trained in, in comparative literature, but I've been working for the past um, 22 years in Washington, not in, in an academic field, but first I was, uh, when I met Christopher, I was a communications director for a group uh, once large and reputable, now neither, uh, called the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, which is basically like an, uh, kind of an ADL for the Arabs or something like that, like an anti anti-discrimination group, civil rights, civil liberties kind of thing. And, and that uh, made me, I think, a fairly visible Arab American before, during and after 9-11. So that, you know, uh, was important in my life because that was something to go through for the whole community, but especially if you were on TV all the time. Right. As I and, and uh, Jim Zogby were, uh, he was for a different group, but we were very visible. And uh, and I, I sort of moved on to spend 10 years working on Palestine issues with a group called the um, American Task Force on Palestine. And uh, about six years ago, we closed that operation down and I migrated over to specializing in the Gulf countries. And, uh, you know, I've also moved from doing mostly TV in, in the late 90s and the early noughts into being mostly a writer and writing columns and, and longer essays and uh, also switched over from mainly uh, civil rights and anti-discrimination stuff here at home to foreign policy. So it's it's a, a shift in medium and a shift in focus. So that's who I am. I I met Christopher in in the capacity of my work at this uh, ADC organization, and uh, but it became immediately very personalized. Well, I should say too, you did me the additional uh, favor of when we were emailing to say uh, to check out the one last lunch compilation, yeah. and I'll just put it up because I have it oh, here. There it is. Yeah, there it is. It's very good. It came out this year. So what it is, is it's uh, it's one last lunch. The subtitle is A Final Meal with Those Who Meant So Much to Us. And it's edited by and collected by Erica Heller, who's the daughter yeah. of Joseph Heller. Oh, yes, right. Joseph Who's the Christopher Hitchens, too, right? Yeah. Um, and it's a very interesting book. I poked through some of the other ones, too. Um, and it's, it is kind of what it sounds like. It's people's sons, daughters, friends, godsons, and so on. Uh, imagining one lunch with a person that they cared about who passed away um, and what that would be like. And it's, there's a lot of variation in them. You did a quite a lengthy and very good uh, entry uh, right. where you meet, uh, you meet Christopher Hitchens one last time at the Bombay Club, which was yeah. a, a, an old haunt in D.C. His favorite, it was his, really kind of his favorite restaurant food-wise. I think there were places a little closer to his house. It wasn't far, but it wasn't really walking distance. But every right. time we ate that food, he would just look dreamy, he would have one bite, and and often he would say, why does anyone ever eat anything else? You know? <laughs> he had this British fondness for good Indian food. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> well, take us to 1998 first, and, well, and just, me, what was me, the first meeting? Well, let me say for the beginning uh, that uh, I was really kind of taken aback to be contacted by Erica, um, yeah. but she apparently had... Um, asked uh, Christopher's uh, widow, Carol Blue, who she thought would be a good candidate to write this. I mean, he has, you know, very distinguished writer friends who right. know how to do this stuff, like Martin Amos and Salman Rushdie and people like that, you know, or just yeah. you know, legendary people. Um, but I think what she was looking for is someone who would, you know, sort of do this and do this quickly in a kind of down and dirty way. And, you know, approaching these, these giants was probably not a great idea. So I was honored to be asked, you know, and to be recommended by Carol, but uh, apparently, uh, but um, it was a little daunting because I'm not a fiction writer, you know, and this is basically an imaginative work. I've never written anything other than nonfiction in, in my life. And so it was, it was a bit of a stretch, but I tried to do it. The funny thing, if I may say, about it is, you know, I worked kind of intensively on it for a few days. 
and really immersed myself in it. <clears throat> and uh, and I sent it off and, and it became like a real memory in a sense. I mean, it's not, I yeah. always knew it wasn't, but it's, it was more like a memory of something that had actually happened for a little while than, you know, a fantasy or something. It, it took on a life of its own in a really funny, weird way. So I don't know. Um, having said that, I can go back to uh, my first meeting with him, if you like. Sure, we'll start with that. I, I want to get back to the last lunch entry after, but yeah, might as well start with how you met him. All right, so I'll describe that. I'm happy to describe that to you. So uh, my, uh, I had just started at uh, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, and my predecessor as the communications director, a man called Sam Husseini, um, uh, who remains an you know an interesting guy and works on a lot of stuff, uh, sort of left wing causes. He had done a lot of work on the bombing of the medicine factory in Khartoum by uh, the um, Ob uh, the uh, Clinton administration in retaliation for the USS Cole. And Christopher, I guess I've come to understand, was, was doing research for what became No One Left to Lie To, the, the history of the worst family, his... his um, he, like, he wasn't a fan of the Clintons. No, and, and neither am I. And yeah, but he wrote this book length um, indictment of the Clintons um, back in the day. Uh, and there was a chapter on on this um, bombing of this factory. And I guess he was doing research. So he had come to understand that Sam had knew a lot about it. And it was fairly recent. And, and so um, I guess he made an appointment to interview Sam at uh, La Tomate, which is a restaurant about a block away from where Christopher um, used to live on, on top of, um, uh, on, uh, it's just behind the Hilton where uh, Reagan was shot. So it was called the Reagan Hilton in, uh, in D.C. It's just at the top of DuPont Circle. Uh, and... Um, so Sam Husseini said, you want, he was being very, very nice to me and kind of trying to give me background on the city and, and make it easy for me to be his successor. And he very kindly said, um, Hitchens is going to interview me. Do you want to come? And I said, yeah, do I want to come? Yeah, of course I want to come. <laughs> you know? uh, so I went and it was noon. And between noon and about 12.45 or 1, Hitchens interviewed Sam had got the basic information and we were having a really good time. And then Sam said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to my office. And I said, well, I'll, st I'll stay for a bit. You want to stay? And he said, yeah. So we stayed there uh, talking and, and drinking and eating a little bit, but mostly talking and drinking. And around five in the evening, uh, his wife and at the time, very young daughter came walking by and they came, they saw us in the window and they came in and, spent you know half an hour with us and then she said all right we'll go home he said i'll be along shortly and it was you know probably about nine at night he <laughs> phone rang that she, is a marathon i have to say she right? basically told him you've been with that guy for like 10 hours drinking and talking crap so <laughs> get your butt home he's like yeah. oh. but yeah. but then he followed up with a really nice email the next day and we were friends after that because it was you know it was definitely I admired him, you know, as a as a public intellectual and a writer, but the connection we made was not a political one. It, it was very much a kind of there was this great ease of uh, communication. There was a, a kind of a, a simpatico um, connection there that yeah. was very strong, and uh, it was a fairly quickly an intimate friendship was built. So it was very nice, you know. And, and, and for example, I, I'll give you an example. I mean, a lot of the people who were significantly younger than him, which I was, um, you know, people in my age cohort who were similarly in his social circles became very upset when he broke with the left, especially over, uh, they could take the Clinton stuff, but not the kind yeah. of 9-11 uh, and pro-Iraq war stuff and they got they, they didn't like any of that and I didn't care because my relationship with him was not a political alliance he was not my guru he was not my mentor he was not my leader right. didn't matter if we disagreed uh, this is my friend I enjoy hanging out with him 
and it's not predicated on any kind of an agreement, right? So, but a lot of uh, it caused a lot of pain to a lot of common friends, but it didn't cause me any pain at all. Well, this is the thing with with uh, friendships and 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 things like that that were kind of in twenty twenty. We're seeing a lot of <laughs> a lot of issues like this. At one yeah. at what point um, do you uh, cut people away when they start diverging from your opinion? He had become a Trumpian under these circumstances. That would have been a real problem. That would have been, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a different story. But he didn't have a white nationalist bone in his body. And yeah, I think he would have, that he would have liked Trump is absurd. It's a joke. And, it's yeah. a joke. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know what he would have done with Trump versus Hillary, but um, Trump has hit every button he could possibly have disliked. He's a racist. He's okay. pandering. The, the thing that Hitchens hated most was uh, religion, religious hypocrisy, religious fanaticism. Trump is the greatest vehicle. I mean, he himself is an utter hypocrite about it, but he's the greatest vehicle of... of, of Fanatical, he's brought fanatical religion into foreign policy for the first time, really, with Pompeo, you know, this fundamentalist, evangelical, lunatic, apocalyptic, you know, rapture Mike over at State Department. He's He's got the first honest-to-God American fascist that I've ever seen in a cabinet in Bill Barr, who is a, you know, Catholic right. He's like straight out of the... Uh, Western European or uh, not Nazi, but a classic fascist, you know, extreme ultra Catholic, like a, uh, a phalangist or a Latin American, you know, uh, fascist. I mean, absolutely Opus Dei stuff. He would have freaked out. And then the plutocratic stuff, the extreme capitalism, the grifting, he would have despised this guy. And there are a couple of people who've claimed on, on Twitter and elsewhere that he would have been certainly pro-Trump. And somebody made a very good response, which is they, they listed all of Hitchens' closest sort of friends. So not one of them is Trumpy at all. You know, people yeah. like David Frum and, and me and various others. And, you know, even those who are conservatives are completely not, you know, at all sympathetic to Trump. No, it seems it seems completely ridiculous. I mean, even his even his brother Peter, who is very much alive, and in some ways the opposite of him, he's a total conservative in England, yeah. but in other ways not that dissimilar from him. Yeah. Uh, I think that's he, he said many times uh, that uh, the the idea that he and he hates Trump too, although you know he doesn't seem yeah. to be kind of conservative, and he says you know <laughs> Christopher would have uh, under no circumstances liked. I mean, he, he disliked any kind of. I Buffoonery, the, the puffed up stuff. You know. Alone. Yeah. Okay. Forget about the hypocrisy and the grifting and the you know the lying and all that. The religious pandering, the pandering to the evangelical right and the Catholic right and this holding of Bibles and all this upside down. <laughs> yeah, laying on of hands and these preachers and Paula White and yabba dabba gabbling in tongues that it would have driven him crazy. This was the thing that he hated the most. And the the thing that I think a lot of people didn't get about his um, post 9-11 break with the nation and with a lot of the of the left was that he saw 9-11 as an attack on secular rational civilization by a gang of religious fanatics waving the kind of pre-enlightenment flag of obscurantism and superstition. He's not wrong about that at all. Now, I didn't like the term Islamofascism, which he was one of the popularizers of, and I talked to him a lot about this, because I think he was giving Al-Qaeda more intellectual credit than they're due. They're not fascists. Fascists are more, like Bill Barr is a fascist. You know, there's a tradition of fascism there. It, it, it's more substantive than the Salafist jihadist nonsense. I mean, it's yeah. it's nonsense, but it's much more sophisticated nonsense than uh, Al-Qaeda's nonsense. Or well, it, kind of stri- it kind of strikes me that this, what's happening now, is kind of the fight that he was hoping to have. I think so. I think and, so. And, and he didn't last long enough, unfortunately, for it. But he, he, maybe he, he saw it elsewhere. He yeah, saw, I mean, 
real threats, but not the maybe expanded the threats beyond the scope of what they actually could do in this country. I think the one thing you you could not have gotten him to do was support a uh, a religiously oriented movement, particularly a right wing religiously oriented movement. He might he might have barely tolerated, and I really mean barely tolerated. Uh, some sort of um, liberation theology kind of stuff, but he would have done it holding his nose. And he, I mean, he did not have respect for Gandhi or for uh, Martin Luther King or something. On the, I mean, he put up with them because the cause is good, but you know, in terms of the substance, it's sort of this. Yeah, the you know, but you attach that to uh, you know the extreme right. Forget it. There's there's no chance. There's no chance. Well, I had a hard time when, you know, the question comes up sometimes, what would he have been doing now? What would he have been saying? What would he have been writing about? And I, I've had a hard time thinking about what he would have been saying on and on as these Trumpian years go on. I, I, in some sense, I felt he would have been a little bit bored of talking about Trump all the time. And you said no. something about Bill Barr. Yeah. I thought, yeah, that's what he would have done. Very deep into Pompeo and Barr. That's he, he would have gone after the the professionals who were yes. holding this guy up. Yes, the 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 importation of yeah. religious fanaticism, the evangelical apocalyptic millennialist lunacy in foreign policy, and the kind of um, uh, neo fascist Catholic um, right wing uh, fascism. That's the only word for it uh, in in the uh, in the Justice Department. And uh, in other places, and I think that he would have looked a lot at, into a lot of that, and he would have, I think, also written a lot about Trump's relationship with uh, with the evangelicals um, and with Paula White and with um, all of these. And he would have done a great job on Jerry Falwell Jr. and uh, Franklin <laughs> Graham and all this crap. He would have, you know, he he. I mean, I really and. Above all, Bill Barr. I find Bill Barr the most sinister figure, uh, you know, other than Trump to himself, to have been a senior political figure in the United States. And I say that including the first W term. I, I'm, thinking, I'm including Cheney and Rumsfeld in that. Yeah. I'm including really sinister people. Uh, you know, and as I say, I'm not at all a fan of Bill Clinton. And yeah. to, so, the, to the person who says to you then that, you know, like, okay, you're hearing the word fascist thrown around a lot. Yeah. It, it, are you, <laughs> why are you calling Bill Barr a fascist? Is that a little bit beyond the pale? No, there's an intellectual tradition that Hitchens would have explained better than I, which is, uh, which in which fascism is above all an iteration of the Western European and Latin American Catholic far right. Now there are, there are exceptions. Nazism has its origins in that, but but you know it also then it takes on through Himmler and to some extent Hitler. Though Hitler never left the church, but still he was wasn't really that much of a Catholic, and 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 Himmler was a pagan. Some of them were Protestants. It's not so much that. No. And Mussolini is maybe less that too. But when you get into things like Franco and the Portuguese fascists and a lot of the other fascists in, in uh, you know, like Romania and Croatia and uh, certainly the fascism in Latin America, you're talking about uh, a direct line between the sort of uh, opus dei extreme right wing reactionary uh, political conservatism and fashion. But you look at Bill Barr and his speech at Notre Dame and his other speeches where he has asserted that basically claimed that uh, basically non-Christians and non-religious people don't really qualify for the same rights of citizenship as believers. And that, that um, citizenship and civic participation must be predicated on his kind of religious, narrow-minded religious bigotry and superstition. And where he has also yoked that bunch of crap 
to uh, a, a a very repressive social agenda and, and a, a, an almost monarchical sense of the U.S. Constitution. It was a, he, his version of the unitary executive model of the U.S. government is the most extreme. And basically, under Bill Barr, we have temporary elected monarchs for four or eight year periods of time. He, his idea of a president is one who short of a kind of arbitrary impeachment and conviction by the House and the Senate couldn't be checked by anything. You know, this stuff about the president can't be investigated by anyone. The president can't be charged or sued. And if the, pre you know, this whole business of, of justice coming in and taking over the defense of Trump in the in the E. Jean Carroll defamation suit, you know, which is going on now. This is incredible. I mean, we should stop just to say what this what this is. This came out the other day, right? Yeah. Do you want to explain it or shall I? No, I'd rather you do it. Okay. So, <laughs> it's so, so uh, E. Jean Carroll is this rather famous writer, used to be for, for um, Vanity Fair and other publications, and she's written a bunch of books. And she has claimed that with increasing specificity that um, many years ago, in a uh, Bergdorf Goodman dressing room, I believe, she was with Trump and, and she had let herself be conned into going in to try something on for him. And when they were in there, he assaulted her and effectively raped her. She doesn't use the word rape, but that he he did rape. I mean, if, if he did what she said, that is legally rape, without doubt. Um, and he denied it and called her a liar. And so she is suing him for defamation because basically to call someone a liar when they're telling the truth is defamatory. But it is, in fact, as I keep saying, a rape case in all but name. It's a bit like uh, Alger Hiss, who was um, you know, convicted of perjury, but it wasn't really a perjury case. The statute of limitations on espionage had passed, which was five years at the time, and he couldn't be charged with espionage, but he could be charged with perjury. And there is an interesting overlap here because Whitaker, the, the turning point in the chamber's Hiss thing was when Hiss said, I, I uh, challenged chambers to say these things about me being a communist. He still hadn't called him a spy, but he said they'd been communists together. And he was saying it in testimony, in congressional testimony. And uh, Hiss is one of his final the defenses was to, before it all came crashing down around him, was to say, well, he's lying, and I challenge him to say it outside the hearing room where he can be sued, because he can't be sued for anything he's saying under oath in a congressional committee. So um, Chambers went on uh, Meet the Press, which was a radio show at the time, and he did repeat the accusations, not about espionage, but about, um, Cham about his having been a, a member of the Communist Party for many years while at state. And uh, then... Uh, Hiss never brought the defamation lawsuit against him, and and what and and then eventually he did. He let himself get goaded into it, and it was in discovery of that lawsuit that Chambers produced the incriminating documents and added espionage to his accusations, and then this led to the perjury charge and all that. So there's a you know a sense, as I say the. You know, the, the E. Jean Carroll thing is a proxy for rape. So when, uh, morally speaking, you know, so when the Justice Department, now I should say, the White House has asked the Justice Department to ask the court to allow the government of the United States to replace Donald Trump as the defendant in the defamation lawsuit. That would do two things. It would mean that the state, the Justice Department and, and the uh, U.S. attorneys would be defending Trump rather than Trump's own attorney. So we'd be paying for everything. And right. we'd, we'd foot the bill for that. Yeah. We'd, foot the, we'd foot the bill for that. We would also get onto the side of the defense all the privileges and authority, even le legal ones, which exist, which a private defendant do doesn't have. Moreover, um, you know, we would, if she wins, who would be responsible for the damages would be the defendant. And that would not be Donald John Trump. That would be the government of the United States. So yeah. we would also pay any damages. It's incredible. 
you know, the theory that that um, Bill Barr has put forward at Trump's request is that when Trump denied, uh, when Trump called her a liar, he was acting in his capacity as president. That is freaking preposterous. Wow. But it, it, but it goes to Bill Barr's monarchical sense of the presidency. Yeah. That you know, anything he does while he's in office is above the law. And, so, and do you buy this thing that Bill, the Bill Barr has somehow changed or turned or so, somehow late in life uh, for some reason that's mysterious, we don't know why, has taken on this different kind of, put this different hat on defending Trump? Or has he always, do you think, been this? I suspect he's always been like this, but I think Trump has a way of bringing the worst out of everybody. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think that maybe Bill Barr was the, was the flunky that Trump needed and couldn't find after Roy Cohen died. And I think that uh, Trump was the neo-authoritarian, quasi-authoritarian leader that Barr was always yearning for and didn't get under, say, George W. Bush or mm -hmm. anything like that, right? So they're made for each other in a sense. I mean, others, I, th I guess Barr wants to serve an authoritarian leader and he's never gonna be president. He's not even a politician, right? He doesn't get elected anything. He doesn't run for office, but he's right. looking for a, a unitary executive kind of guy. And Trump is looking for an extremely fanatical, ruthless, flunky, uh, you know, so, so, so different than Jeff Sessions. Because Jeff Sessions was, is, is a, a thoroughgoing racist and an absolutely bad person, but he wasn't going to do anything like this. He recused himself because it's a no brainer. I mean, if you just apply the normal logic of US traditions and law, you wouldn't be doing any of this stuff. And Je I, Sessions didn't do, anything like this. He did a lot of terrible things, but you know, he was ideologically a very bad guy, especially when it comes to race and immigration. I was kind of a white nationalist in a way, but he, he operates more or less within the law. Whereas I think Bob, Bill Barr, you exit you through the looking glass into this world of temporary elected monarchs. It, it does sort of feel like it's a it's like some nice last rodeo for some of these things. Yeah, think of Rudy Giuliani and, and just yeah, absolutely. a bunch of people. They're just kind of oh, going out for going out for a wild ride. I mean, it's a, it's incredible that it's a collection of the worst people in the world, at least in the United States. Now, I mean, they really have found people that, you know, with low level grifters to the worst grifters and, and everyone kind of gravitates. Really the worst people are attracted to this man, um, especially knowingly. I mean, there are all these followers of his who have this fantasy of Trump, but most of the people around him know exactly who he is and what they're dealing and who they're dealing with. But there's advantage here. There's there's a kind of uh, corruption. It's very much like a criminal organization. It's very much Max Boot, the former neoconservative, now turned basically cent, you know center left or yeah. or center center. Definitely not further right than center center, um, and I would say moderately center left. Um, you know, has said it's a criminal conspiracy. And George Will, who's definitely still a, a you know solid conservative, said that this is a, he has called it a criminal regime. He said, this is a literal quote from a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago. He said, the government of the United States is now ruled by a gangster regime. That was exactly what he wrote. And of course, he's quite right. I, I was watching an old video of, uh, of Hitchens in the mid 90s, the so Clinton era, and somebody was interviewing him and talking about why do people kind of gravitate towards these people and they don't really get anything out of it and they kind of hop from from administration to administration they don't just seem to have any values it's it's yeah. just they're there kind of for the sake of it and he said i, I wrote it down or I, I copied it and the quote that he said is is that he thought it was vicarious connection with power yeah and i think that's it, exactly it I think, and said, I, I think that for them, just that picture, perhaps on the piano in later years, yeah. there's the candidate making his acceptance speech and off to the left is someone no one's bothered to identify in the caption. Yeah. And that's them. That's enough for some people. That's the high point. <laughs> I, I think that's a very good point. And I think also that 
fetishization of power in terms of either the individual or even more the office itself. Because if Trump were just, you know, a hotelier, these people wouldn't be behaving this way. He'd have to rely on like Michael Cohen. Right. So a very different caliber of person than Bill Barr, right? That right. those are people who operate on totally different registers of, at every level. Um, but you also need to explain that what the question Michael Tomaski uh, asked uh, was a wonderful writer who writes for um, he has a the journal of Demo Democracy, a journal of opinion, I believe it's called a quarterly. Writes for the New York Times a lot which I used to, but don't anymore. And uh, he writes frequently for the Daily Beast. And he has a piece in the Daily Beast, I think it's today, in which he asks, why don't these people speak out? I mean, it's clear that Kelly and Mattis, at least one, if not both of the, especially Kelly, are the sources for this story about Trump, you know, absolutely uh, slandering uh, American dead and refusing to go to the battlefield in France because there was rain and he didn't want to mess up his weird hairdo and all that stuff. And, and um, you know, the question that uh, Tomaski was asking is, why don't these people speak up? What can Trump do to these people? He was saying, look, he, he can't do, he's not a dictator. He can't do anything to George W. Bush. He can't do anything to John Kelly. Right. He can't do anything to Mattis, who he mentions has about $7 million. Why do they not do it? And I don't know, but I think the um, awe of the office is part, probably some part of it. Is, you know, there's a real reticence to do lasting damage to the office of the presidency. And Trump is conflated with the office of the presidency. There's this, there's this I think there's this Oz-like quality that is very hard to break for a lot of people, that as long as he is POTUS, you mustn't, you know, go too far. It's, it's yeah. a terrible, but, you know. There is always the, the hope, maybe it's naive hope, that it's a, merely a question of timing for some people, right? I mean, there mm -hmm. is a sense in which if Mattis had said something as soon as he was out, we would have forgotten what he said long ago. We almost have forgotten what he said a couple months ago. Well, right? he, he was very clear a couple months ago that Trump is unfit for office. So he was clear, right. But but if he had done it a, a year ago, I think that would have been, timing-wise, probably not a good opportunity. Well, I think Tomaski's point is, look, if you're ever going to speak up, speak now, because if yeah. you speak up after the election, no one's going to give a damn. And if you, let, if you don't speak up now and he gets reelected, and he really starts to to do permanent, lasting, irreversible damage to the democratic system, which is kind of hanging by a thread anyway, yeah. and it's rotten from the inside. But but you know he could really, in a second term, go go you know bonkers, and yeah. probably would. Uh, you know what are you going to say then? How are you possibly going to live with yourself? And and I think he's right. I think you do have to ask yourself why at this stage, people who could help prevent him from getting reelected are just not doing it. And, and you, you know, at some point, my guess, I, I'm not in their heads, so I don't know. My guess is that reverence and awe for the sanctity of the office is a key factor among, maybe among some others, but it, it can't be cowardice because Madison Kelly are not cowards. You know, no. they, they've risked their life. They know, I mean, physically they're not cowards. And and I don't think politically necessarily they're cowards by any means. So it's something else. And um, I, I'm suggesting that that same kind of fetishism that you posited gets people to want to serve these guys, you know, just have the picture in the corner, as you said. I, I, it also might be holding back people m more senior who just don't want to come out and say the president of the United States is a... Uh, you know, is this bad? And I think Mattis has gone pretty far, but Kelly is not doing it. He's, and no, he said nothing publicly. He really. won't say anything, but he's clearly the source for Goldberg and the others. And it's been the story is, I mean, you know, Trump and the Trumpians can deny it all they like. It's confirmed by Fox, by Jennifer Griffin over at Fox, it's confirmed by AP, confirmed by the New York Times, confirmed by the Washington Post. I mean, you know, so. Yeah, I think we'll see. I think we'll see more even. I think Goldberg said that yeah. more is probably he expects to see more come out which means yeah, more today, come out. today is probably in is the worst day probably of trump's presidency because you had 
uh, at least three major blows in addition to, and this is the day we're speaking. I don't, I don't know when this uh, podcast goes out, but Wednesday night we're talking. Wednesday, about. yeah, Wednesday the, I think it's the tenth. Uh, yes, yeah, the ninth. Wednesday the ninth, right? So uh, today, there were uh, Woodward released the tapes of Trump telling him in like in January about how bad the virus is, et cetera. I mean, well, you know, around the time he was saying it's nothing, it'll go away. We're going to go down from five cases to one case. Oh, he lied. He lied to the public about a life and death situation. And his defense is he didn't want to panic people. And it's just outrageous. Uh, it's a brutal blow. Both of those, the two, it's hard to damage him. Something like the Michael Cohen book, it doesn't damage him because people don't care about you know, they, they know what he is anyway. But the military story damages him because a lot of his supporters like the military. And it's just not it's very counter to the image he's created about yes. his. Relationship. It does harm his image, which which like the paying of prostitutes doesn't. Right. Or something like that. Or the gangsterism doesn't. And, and the poll has shown that. I mean, there is a recent poll that said the military. Um, yeah support for him versus in 2016 is significantly less than it was. Significantly less. And, yeah. and you can tell that the, a lot of the rank and file are starting to join the general officers in disliking him very much. And things like the, you know, his, this thing, and not for the public, but for the soldiers, the refusal to pursue the Russian bounties in Afghanistan, the fact that, that there are credible intelligence reports that Russia was paying bounties for U.S. troops, in, which totally makes sense, by the way, um, and, and it's probably true, um, that he, he won't even acknowledge it as, as, a, as an issue and let alone pursue it with the Russians. So this damages him. And then I think the, the, the COVID thing also is very damaging. Because his position basically is he can't deny he said this because Woodward has him on tape and the tapes are on online. You can go to the Washington Post and listen to him saying this stuff. And the other stuff, the, the contrary public things that he was saying, oh, it's no big deal. It's less than the flu. It's going away. All that, you know, totally opposite of what he was privately telling Woodward. Yeah. That stuff is not deniable. So the only defense he has is that he was trying to save people by lying to them, and it just doesn't add up. So it's going to hurt him because it's, it's too clumsy of an. I mean, it's the best one he's got, I guess. But it's too but it's clumsy not... of an excuse. I mean, that is a that is a you know Joe Biden or Lincoln Project ad. Oh, for sure. Already written. Already written. I mean, it's probably already out. Uh, yeah, I think it probably is, and and it's also something that Biden can hammer him with until November 3rd at the debates, and it just doesn't work. So I think you're right about all of that. And I actually think uh, the walls are kind of closing in on him right now. That this is the, the, the more, you know, people were worried about surprises, you know, October surprise, September surprise. There are a lot of them, but they're all hurting Trump. And yes, Biden is playing it very low key, very straight. He hasn't made any big mistakes yet. There's a lot of little ones. And yeah, the, the debate's coming up. But unless Biden, you know, but Trump has helped Biden, right, by, by setting the bar so low, by saying, you know, he doesn't know where he is and he can't finish his sentence. We know from the Sanders debate that he's old and he's still gaffy, silly Biden who says all these ridiculous things. But, but if you only listen to Trump, you expect this guy to like fall over at any second. And unless he does fall on his face, he's going to right. seem OK. Meanwhile, he's not going to say crazy things. And tr it's not like Trump isn't an old man who shows his age either. And it's not like he's particularly articulate. They're both a couple of aging, tongue-tied gaff machines. <laughs> the difference is one of them is crazy. Right. And one of them is just kind of a standard, bland, centrist politician. Right. And if pe yeah. you know, unless people want four more years of crazy, they're probably going to be attracted to the normal. Well, you you say it's one of the worst days of his presidency, but according yeah. to Lou Do according to Lou Dobbs tonight, uh, yeah. this is this is one of the best. Yeah, if you well, want to see what state-run TV in America would look like, you can watch that program. Of course, Lou Dobbs is an absolute hack, and and so is Hannity and Tucker Carlson, who I used used to know Hitchens, and Hitchens always told Tucker, "Don't do too much TV. Never give up on writing." Just keep um, writing. Yeah, I remember hearing him say that. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. he's not, I, I did many TV shows with Tucker uh, in uh, 99, 2000, 2001. Many times I went on CNN with him. And he, I mean, he, he, we haven't seen each other for, uh, the last time I saw him was at Hitchens House, by the way. It was a big party. It wasn't a dinner. He wasn't that close to him. But but it was it was some sort of a party. And I saw him and, you know, we talked. Anyway, right. point B. Point being, he was not the Grand Wizard of the KKK back no. then, but he sure is now. Yeah, he's he's really lacing it in there to pretty much every episode. It's really extraordinary. Nationalist, white supremacist, all the way. So I, let's that's good. This is that's kind of what I was hoping would happen is that we'd talk a little bit about something about Hitchens, and then we'd be able to <laughs> explode into something that's happening today. Let's talk. Let's use this to segue into what a, a typical night with Christopher Hitchens. Um, would be like at his apartment. Is there such thing as a typical night with Christopher? Yeah, yeah I, I think so. At least for me, I probably everybody had their own experiences. Um, usually, it always involved uh, copious alcohol. If you want, I mean, there's no problem going there and not drinking. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it was it was something we used to do together a lot, and uh, you know, he enjoyed it. And um, when he was dying, he used to have to take a lot of painkillers. And he hated them because he thought, I mean, just they used to drive him crazy because he thought they were um, mind numbing and conversation killing and inward dragging substances. Whereas cigarettes and alcohol, which he loved, were, were gregarious and tongue loosening and yeah. social and interactive. And, he, you know, so the thing is, uh, come in, the door is unlocked. That's the first thing. Right. So if you're if your friends you know the doorman knows you right um and uh you you don't even necessarily have to be called up he lives in one of these buildings where you need permission uh lived on the top floor of a really nice apartment building uh, as i say at the top of the hill behind dupont circle uh and um so for me it was always a matter of just going in you know, just opening the door and walking in very spacious apartment and without all that much furniture and it's a matter of figuring out where Hitch is in, in this. So you can kind of follow the voices or you could just go and sit down and wait for people to come to you. Or you could go to the little room off the side of the kitchen where all the booze is and pour yourself one. He had a, a pretty strict rule, um, but he would break it sometimes. But his basic rule is. I'll get you your first drink. After that, you know where it is. Don't bother me. Just go for it. You know. <laughs> Not a bad rule. And that's so a fine rule. And so, you know, there would be uh, a period of time of getting to know whoever else was there because frequently there were people one didn't know and uh, conversation and talking and whatnot. And then uh, often there would be dinner, um, more or less, could be very informal, could be more you know, catered, sometimes it's catered, but a lot of times it was just, you know, whatever it was doing or takeout. Um, and uh, that could be a very long affair. He had in his dining room this very long table and uh, people would kind of sit around it and uh, lots of wine and plenty of smoking and uh, lots of talking. And those, you know, did, once you're at the table, very frequently, you know, it would be around say nine o'clock or something, uh, a lot of times you would more or less be there until, you know, one, two, three, whatever it is, yeah. you know, it's with some breaks, but then it becomes like this kind of court, uh, where Hitch would, would, would hold court for however long it was. And, um, as I say, very relaxed, very informal, but, you know, intellectual conversations, politically charged, yeah. not for the faint of heart, full of witticisms, lots of humor, lots of joking. Uh, but there were not two Hitchens. There were, you know, Hitchens moods. I mean, sometimes he was happy, sometimes he was angry, sad, he could be pro you, against you, whatever. But yeah. there was only one person as, that I ever saw, and I saw him in all kinds of situations. Uh, so what you see on TV in the lectures and on the, is just the way he was the it's, whole time. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what I was I was going to ask you too. Is that it? Was there another? No, I guess there were. He had his friendships and he had his intimacies, but right. He, you, what you see is pretty much what you got with him. Yeah, it's what you see was what you got, and and he he was you know extremely tolerant, 
of his guests, generally speaking, and his friends. And uh, he was a, a very, very devoted friend, at least to me. I mean, I, I sort of knew that he was one of those people where I could go to him and ask him to lend me a bunch of money and he would give it to me and then ask me what it was for. Or I could show up and, and I mean a bunch, uh, never did, but you know, he would have done it. Uh, or I could have shown up with a suitcase at his door at 3 a.m. and say, I need to stay with you for a while. And the question would be, which room do you want? You know, that yeah. kind of thing. I mean, really, no, no kidding about that stuff, right? Yeah, he was serious about it. Yeah. At, very serious about it. Once, once you're in, you're in. And, uh, you know, so uh, I think that's really important to to kind of emphasize. I, it was one of the things that I really loved about him was that he knew how to be a really good friend. Uh, this was my experience and um, I think a lot of people's experience with him. because He took friendship very seriously and he was a, a very good friend. In addition to which he had a certain kind of aplomb. He, sometimes could get upset, but usually he didn't. And he would, you know, somebody would do something and he'll look up and say, well, they will do that, won't they? Or one time someone got um, very intoxicated and staggered off and uh, was then spotted, sort of passed out on the floor. And then somebody went into one of the bathrooms and it was so sprayed with with um with vomit basically and was, ah you know this is really bad and his wife went and looked and she screamed ah you know because it was just i mean it was her it was like a see i don't know if you've ever seen the film manhunter no. uh, okay well there's a scene where there was this murder and they turn on the lights and there's like blood everywhere this is like that you didn't hold back yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean the books had the books in there had to all be thrown out let's put it uh, you know that's how bad it was <laughs> so finally, after all this commotion hitch gets up he it is about three in the morning he walks over there he looks he looks at him, eh, i've seen worse <laughs> that's, <it. laughs> that's good that brings us back maybe to uh to the one last lunch piece mm -hmm. i wanted to just mention something in here i mean one of the things about uh all of the the pieces is that they kind of have to uh approach the fact that um, they're talking to somebody and the knowledge that they're talking to somebody that's gone and everybody right. makes a contribution kind of has their own way of doing that. Well, it also uh, means you're talking to yourself, basically, but yeah. Right, but exactly. I mean, your, it, it seems, yeah, and it seems that like for you is it particularly interesting and kind of a, uh, affecting mm. because you were writing about somebody who had no uh, particular desire or belief in the afterlife you know it's right. you're you're truly just conjuring somebody oh, out of thin yeah. air he he was not just an atheist he was a categorical atheist and an anti-theist so in the sense that he would say well you know i'm sure there's no god and there's absolutely rubbish and all that but even if there were i would be against that god right whereas i'm an agnostic uh, and and we would argue about religion, and he would, ended up always saying to me, "Well, I can destroy any religious argument, but I don't really have an argument against what you say." And then he would try to convince me that I really was an atheist. <laughs> Atheists <laughs> will tend to do that sometimes. Yeah, they all. <laughs> they all and I would insist that no. And then you know, when I would corner him, I would say, "Well, actually, you're an agnostic." And absolutely not, dear boy. You know. <laughs> what I mean, part of it's polemical, you know, he, he right. just, uh, you can't, it's not, you, my, with my hardcore agnosticism, you can't have much of an argument, right? I mean, ultimately, it's just like, we all don't know. But his, his uh, categorical atheism uh, and scientific rationalism be, was a very good position for having an, an, a long argument with the various different religious types, yeah. which I wouldn't bother to do. Uh, you know, and so it, it's in that sense intellectually useful in a way that radical skepticism really isn't in a fun, unless you get into philosophy. Yeah, I think it was probably pretty good for at least American Christianity that this thing came along. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, there's, a, there's a certain amount of annoying uh, aspects to the new atheists and, and some are more annoying than others. But I think, you know, if you're looking at it from the perspective of someone out of continental Europe or England or something, you could roll your eyes and say, okay, you're, you're talking about a God that, that almost nobody believes in anymore. But, right. you know, in America, they, 
they really do. do. Yeah, they certainly do. <laughs> I think first of all that the the Christians who engaged him, uh, and there were lots of them, yeah, uh, found him useful as a foil, right. and they enjoyed it, and they thought it was useful, and and they liked they liked being challenged by him. They didn't necessarily like the others with like. I have a problem with a lot of the of the so-called new atheists, uh, and uh, some of them I think engage in bigotry. Um, I'm not at all a fan of Sam Harris, and some of them seem to me to be as kind of intolerantly categorical as their religious opponents. So yeah. I'm not crazy about that. But I did I enjoyed Hitchens a lot, and I thought he was by far the best of the bunch. And so did the religious people who engaged with him, you know. I did too. I think a lot of the problems, some of the problem anyway, with some of the new atheists seemed to me to be that they really never knew what it was like to be religious. Right. You know, I, I came from, I come from a, a vaguely Catholic background and I, I dabbled in some of the more shout and holler style uh, evangelism when I was a young teenager and everything and, uh, you know, hands in the air, falling backwards and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, so you get a sense of what's going on there. And, well, it's um, interesting. You know, uh, I'm sorry. Please. No, go ahead. This. Well, what uh, I it's just, it's just it's just a different perspective. If you never grow up with that, right? You do you do miss something? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong, but you're I, missing something. I think that's a good point. I don't think uh, Christopher was ever religious, and in his book, uh, you know, Hitch Twenty Two, his memoir, he talks about how he was, you know, kind of atheist as a very young boy, and his teacher right. and all that. Uh, on the other hand, he had a real affection and respect for uh, Anglican traditions in the sense of his English culture that he grew up with. He was a, a, a big fan of Oliver Cromwell. His fi he's one of my favorite fundamentalists. He loved the iconoclasm of Cromwell. He, he, there was something really, uh, the way Cromwell kind of <clears throat> smashed the icons. <clears throat> Yeah. And kind of uh, traditions of superstition as a, uh, he thought was, I think, very salutary for the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and rationalism. Uh, and so he liked Cromwell a lot. And uh, there were uh, he, you know, his his um, he had some Jewish uh, ancestors. But his second wife, uh, Carol, is Jewish, although also an atheist. But. Um, he, uh, with his daughter, I mean, they did used to do, I, I don't, she didn't have a bat mitzvah as far as I know, but, and I think I would know, but, but they did used to do seders occasionally and mm -hmm. some kind of Jewish traditions that they would do from time to time, um, not in a religious sense, but in a tradition sense. And he had a certain respect for that. Um, and I think he, he did in a funny way while railing against it, took religion seriously as a civilizational and intellectual history um, driver of things. Now, of course, he was a, a great iconoclast, so he loved to kind of trash, you know, uh, especially in more traditional faiths, so he said that, that the worst thing that ever happened in history was the, was the um, Yom Kippur, the, the, the defeat of the Hellenists by the... Uh, by the, the the Maccabees, because otherwise, he said, you know, there wouldn't have been any Christianity, and then there wouldn't have been any Islam, and we might have been spared the whole thing. He said, and <laughs> very harsh on on Catholicism and Mother Teresa and popes and whatnot. Uh, but then he agreed to serve as the devil's advocate in the canonization process for yeah. Mother Teresa, and he went and he spent all day testifying at the Vatican. So he took it seriously enough to do that. And then finally, he, he um, you know, he would say things like, uh, he, you know, called the Prophet Muhammad a, an epileptic plagiarist. Uh, but at the same time, I think he was, he was very good about, um, you know, kind of discrimination and defamation. No, not definitely. Yeah, I mean, in other words, he would distinguish between the religion and the people. And he did not... Um, countenance kind of discrimination against Muslims but at the same time he he did you know so he was very good on Islamophobia in terms of people uh, and I don't think there was any bigotry in his you know he was sometimes uh, put in the camp of Islamophobes because he was so categorical in his 
rejection of Islam. And I would always tell people, look, he's an equal, this is like South Park. He's an equal opportunity trasher of people. Right, you happen to notice the ones that offend, yeah, that are, <laughs> that offend you, but he, he yeah. yeah. Look at the way he's talking about, you know, the, the, the Jews and Christians. And, and you know, I was once there when, when someone was trying to make the case that Buddhism was a bit better than Hinduism and the three monotheists. Like <laughs> Both of us unloaded on this guy. You know, and we're just like, you clearly know nothing about, say, the Japanese empire. You know, you right. could, I mean, there are, you don't understand. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it would be harder to say that now following the Myanmar stuff. Uh, but, you right. know, there was this idea that, every, you know, that all Buddhists are kind of like, uh, you know, uh pacifists monks and, and it yeah, just they're all they're all jainists or something yeah exactly it, it completely detached from the political history of of uh buddhism as a social text in in central, south and east asia totally right. detached from it it was kind of hippie fantasy so he was he was just very good on being fair-minded in his hatred of superstition this is a thing that this really gets, I think, to the crux of what I think I and other people who never actually knew him at all, but just from reading and watching his stuff, are attracted to. And it's it is this this kind of uh, unabashedness about being able to see things from from both sides, right? And and from and from having it somehow in himself, where he he was a I don't know I've I've thought of this before as, as him being like a kind of a heretic, like yeah. a good, solid, almost Protestant tradition heretic. Yes, I think that's uh, right. Do you think that's true? Yes, I, mean, I do, except I don't think he saw himself as a heretic. I think he saw himself yeah. as, a, as a contrarian. I think he saw himself as an iconoclast and a contrarian, which is why he would always say, I am a, not just an atheist, I'm an anti-theist. Yeah. I don't believe in God, but I am also against God. But a good heretic would have to say that. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, well, he did. And I think that's right. From that, from that, I guess, that Protestant tradition, you would have to say that. And, and he, indeed, he did say that. Um, I, I hasten to say, so that we don't sort of veer into hagiography here, uh, that I I disagreed with him a lot on a lot yeah. of things, and I think he got a lot of things incredibly wrong. Let's uh, talk about some of those. Yeah, I. I...